Senator Edmonds now moves for suspension to revert to Senate bills on third reading and final passage subject to call for the purpose of calling Senate Bill 313 by Senator Edmonds, which is an act to amend Title 17 relative to elementary and secondary education and school choice to authorize the development of the Louisiana Giving All True Opportunity to Rise Scholarship Program. I'm not reading all that. What is the first title? Um, Senator Edmonds. Thank you, members. I know we've been here a long time, and I'll make a opening very, uh, very short. We have vetted this bill for weeks about the opportunity to um, have dollars follow the students, parents having their greatest amount of control. I do want to commend uh, Dr. Brumley and the direction we're going. I really believe this is another tool in the toolbox that will uh, aid us as we move forward. But I thought this would be the last thing I say before we, we do have some amendments. Uh, Senator Kennedy, um, put out a text today and I want to read it. He said, no one is coming to save our schools in Louisiana but ourselves. If we want a prosperous future for Louisiana, we can't keep trapping students in classrooms where they can't learn. It's time for school choice in Louisiana. And with that, Mr. President, we have some amendments to offer. Amendments sent up by Senator Talbot. They are set number 3749-3749. Senator Talbot, on your amendments. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, um, this amendment was released, I guess, about three or four hours ago. There's one small change. We're deleting lines. If you look on page four, we're deleting lines. The, the current amendment that's showing up on the computer right now does not have lines 24 through 31 on page four or 48 through 59. Lines 24 through 31. So other than that, the, the bill is very, very similar to what we did last Thursday. Um, if not almost completely the same, except it does not have Senator Jackson Andrews amendments on it. And it does not have uh, Senator Miller's amendments on it either. So the part that we deleted was the part dealing with the procurement and the um, approval of the program manager. We're gonna let um, people higher up than me didn't want that in there, so we're going to let Bessie deal with that. The other main thing we're deleting is all references to the local MFP, the dollar amounts in the, in the current amendment that was on last Thursday. We had 80% of the average local state MFP for the first phase and then 400% and all that. All that were taken out, so basically what we're going to do, we're going to tell Bessie Y'all decide, y'all know better than, than us on deciding how much money should go to a voucher kid to educate them. Let them deal with it. They, they're gonna submit that to us because it's subject to appropriation, which is on, on page four on lines 41 through 44. And we can decide whether we wanna approve that, increase that, decrease that, whatever. So that is basically what the amendment does and it gets everything in the proper posture and I would ask for your favorable adoption. Should be on the computer. S Senator Tabot, hold up one second. Let's see if we can make sure the amendments are up there. Are the amendments up, members? I need a Head shake and nod, something. They're on. They're online. All right, members. They're, they're, sorry, Senator Talbot. The their, their amendments are up. Okay. Um, again, I'd be happy to ask any any questions, and the amendment does get the bill in the proper posture. Senator Jackson, you have pushed your 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 floor bill. You have the you have the floor on the bill. These are amendments, so hold on, amendments. Hold on, hold on. Ah, floor on the amendment. Okay, gotcha. Okay, but we had a little technical difficulty, members. 
We're all, we're all squared up now. Right now, so based, just so everybody knows, for the floor on the amendment, not calling you up now, is Senator Jackson. That's all I have up here for the floor on the amendment. So if you, not yet, let me finish doing the amendment, Senator Jackson. Oh, are you, uh, Tal are you, Senator Talbot, are you finished with the amendment? Gotcha, okay. Y'all yeah, okay. could, and then now I have Senator Price for a question on the amendment, just so we're all so situated. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. No. Is this the appropriate time for a motion to divide the amendments and divide amendment number two, which is the amendment that- now, Senator Jack, let, you gotta let Senator Price ask his question okay. and then we'll get to you. Because of the mess up, I would have normally called Senator Price first, but we had a technical issue. So if you wanna just sit right there, we'll, we'll click floor on the amendment. Senator Price, for a question on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I just saw the amendments in. Again, we're in the situation where we got eight pages of amendments. And I know you, you're trying to explain them, but you're sitting there trying to read through to make sure that we're doing this. And again, I'm going to say, uh, Senator Luno said it the, before, with eight pages of amendment, this is just not the way that we need to be doing business, do you think? Well, I would answer that by saying, other than deleting those eight lines, this amendment has been on the previous amendment, which has been online since, I think we got that amendment several hours ago, and it's really the same, it's really no different from last Thursday. The only substantive change are the two things I was talking about, where we're deleting the part about the procurement process and we're deleting the part about the funding process. Other than that, it's, it almost identically mirrors Thursday's bill. Yeah, well, it would have been nice, you say, three hours ago. I mean, we was debating other bills. I know, didn't read I know. Other bills, so didn't go to this bill to see. But it would have been nice if me if you had come up and announced that they were online, so we could have started looking at them three hours ago. I understand. I was. I understand. I just think this is not the way we should be doing it. Thank I, you. I, I respect you. Let me deal with this one first. Sen Senator, I see no more questions on the amendment. Senator, Senator Jackson for the floor on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I share the concerns of Senator Price regarding this nine-page amendment. From what I can see, and I could be wrong because we haven't had much time to look at it, the accountability provisions have changed from the last amendment, and it removes uh, the accountability that this body voted on. So if this is the appropriate time, Mr. President, I am asking, making the motion to divide the amendments only for amendment number two, that we divide that amendment from the set of amendments and vote on it separately. That's my motion. If we're gonna take up a eight or nine page amendment that the Senate has not had an opportunity to view in the late hour of the evening. Okay, members, we have a motion by Senator uh, Jackson Andrews to take out amendment number two. Or is there any objection to that? Senator Talbot objects. It's a non-debatable motion. Members, I'm trying to make sure we do this correct. Those in favor of dividing the amendments, that's the correct terminology, will vote yes. Those opposed 
will vote no. Everybody understand? Madam Secretary, open the machines. Vote your machine, members. Fifteen, the, the fifteen yeas and Madam Secretary, close the machine. Fifteen yeas and twenty-four nays, and the motion fails to carry. Back, back on, we're back on the amendment, Senator, Senator Luno, for a question on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Talbot. Yes, sir. Let's let's look through these. Tell me tell me what Amendment Number One does. So Amendment Number One, we're deleting the floor amendments by by the ones that I had last Thursday, which is, I guess, the way the drafters wanted to do it. So that pretty much tell wipes. Tell me what those amendments were. The ones that that you had on there you're deleting. That basically is this bill is what we deleted. And then they wanted to start over. They thought it'd be better just to start over and add a few things. So is this so, a substitute bill? Nope, not in my opinion. Why would it not be a substitute bill if it's starting over and you're you're putting that in? Well, I I would think a substitute bill is different terminology, but this with with, with germaneness. But I mean, if you want to get a ruling on whether it's substitute, I don't I don't think uh, I, I can I can make that ruling. I can give you my opinion. So if you want to make the ruling, we'll come uh, back to please it. do. All right. So it in amendment number one, it takes up pretty much everything that was in the bill already. Is that correct? In the amendment, yes. In the amendment, takes yeah. that, okay. All right, let's go to amendment number two. What does that one do? Amendment number two deletes the floor amendments that were uh, adopted by Senator Jackson Andrews on Thursday. And what did those floor amendments deal with? Those floor, I mean, I, I don't have them in front of me, but those floor amendments dealt with some accountability language that was in the, I think, the statutes dealing with vouchers, with the state-run voucher program. So about letter grades and things like that. That's what they dealt with. And what was the accountability issues there? What what was she trying to, to well, do? Well, uh, what and I agree that we need to have accountability accountability issues. What we were saying was one of the things that I disagreed with was giving a letter grade to an ESA school. If you want, I can go through the the accountability in the amendment now and tell Won't you why. You okay. Well? All right. First thing that that let me stop. I'm you. Sorry. Is this, is this directly with Amendment Two? Is that what you're talking about, or is it? I'm in just a telling you. Amendment? I'm telling you what's in Amendment Set. 3749. I'm not, I'm saying this is why I don't think we need uh, Katrina Jackson Andrews Amendment because there's already accountability in what I'm doing. And you're, and those accountability ones are in a different amendment? Th that is in 3749. But it's, but it's, it's like one, two, three, it's one of well, these other amendments that's I, I, within that set? All I can do, I can tell you, I can read parts of the amendment that address accountability if you'd like me to do that. Okay, we'll come back to that too. All right. All right, so. That's number three. No, the, well, tell me what number three is. Number three That's the Senator is Miller. Senator Miller. Honestly, I don't remember the, us adopting floor amendments by Senator Miller. Um, so why do you want to delete those if you don't even remember us adopting them? Well, I, I, I just, it's been a long day. I guess I'd have to. It has. It, it, I know you've had a long day as well. Um, I don't think they were substantive, but uh, I, I can't answer that question. But I can find that answer out for you. All right, you. so we don't know why why we have Amendment Three. I don't recall at this time why what Senator Miller. Is there something you could refer to that would that you'd be able to tell me? I know it's not a memory test. Wait, say that again. It's it's not a memory test. Is there some document you could refer to that would tell I, us what honestly, that is and why I, you want I, to take I, it out? I must be blanking. I just don't remember him doing an amendment on the okay, floor. We can come back to that one. But we can. Yeah. All right, tell me about four. All right, four, on page, one. We did leading lines two through 13, and we are inserting the following, basically just kind of states what- let me, let me interrupt you one second. Tell me what we deleted, what was that concerning? What was that about? So on page one, we delete, I think they're just rephrasing what's there, but I mean, I could read it to you. It says, okay. to amend Act RS 17, colon 236, and to enact chapter 43-C. I mean, it's basically, it's all the same language here. 
and as you know, this isn't my bill and there's a lot of people working on this and I know that's no excuse for not knowing exactly what the amendment does, but it's just basically restating and repositioning what lines two through 13. I don't think there's really any difference between amendment number four and what we're deleting, but that's just the way this is laid out. But I don't think it's, it's I don't think it's anything of substance. It's lines two through 13 in the, in the, in the bill and there's nothing of substance? Well, it's, it's I mean, I can read it. Uh, I'll just read you what was deleted, okay. and I'll read you what was what we're adopting. Right. To amend and react RS 17-236 and to enact Chapter 43C of Title 17, revised statutes in 1950 to be comprised of RS 17-4037, 1, uh, one through 4037.4 relative to elementary. I mean, I think what they're doing is they're referencing what we're doing in this bill. We're, we're, we're referencing school choice. We're representing the Gator, LA Gator program and we're requiring the Department of Education to coordinate with the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to conduct a survey on educational resources to authorize the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to develop the program and promulgate rules to provide relative to funding for the program and to provide for related matters. Um, so I, it doesn't look like there's really much different language in what we're deleting and what we're adopting. I don't know if they just wanted to move it in a different spot. Who, but is, who is they? I thought they well, were your I mean, amendments. They are my amendments, Senator Luno, but as you know, this is part of the governor's package and I'm working with their staff okay, to try to get it in the correct posture. That's fair so enough. I don't think there's really any substantive difference between those two, just laying out what, what is, is it, the purpose of this bill. It references in the, in the act, it references 17, what is that, 40, 17, 40, 37 point whatever? Mm -hmm. What is that? I do not know what that is. I do not know what that. I do right, not well, have that statute the, in front of me. Let's go to the language that amendment number four would add. Tell me about that language and what that does. All right, amendment number four is basically just adding almost verbatim the language from lines two through 13 of the bill. Again, I'm not, I'm sure it's not exactly to the T because I already see some things that are different, but. Um, well, why don't, you, why don't you just tell me what's different about it then? Um, well, let's see. I know in the original bill, it talks about revised statutes in 1950. I don't see that language in here. I think everything from line, let's see, from line 17 down are the, are the exact same language we have in the bill here. But, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to answer your question on amendment number four. I can't tell you the difference. I mean, I read it, it sounds like it's just laying out what this bill is doing and then you get into the meat of it as we go further See, I down. I can't help you with that either because I hadn't had a chance to read these eight pages of amendments, so I can't well, I don't know where they're going either. In fairness, this amendment, 3749, was this, is the same language as the amendment. Hang on. It's the exact same language in the amendment that we had on Thursday. So it, why it's, are we re if it's the exact same language, why are we replacing it in yet a, another amendment? That's a good question because we killed yeah, a lot of answer. trees. I, I think somebody must be connected to the paper contract here. But the amendments on Thursday and the amendments today are very, 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 very similar. Well, I'm trying to figure so, out why we need these eight pages of amendments. If, if, I, if so I, I'm not going to argue with I'm not going to argue with the merit of your question. All right, if we can't do any better on four, let's go to five. Tell me about that one. All right. We're deleting number, lines 15 through 17. What is that first? Right, it looks like you're not going to like the answer, but it looks like we're doing the same thing. So the paragraph on the amendment that goes through right here on amendment number five, that is line 29 through, well, really through the end of the page on 43, and then lines one through 10 on the second page mirrors what we did on the amendments from Thursday. I mean, I know in section A, we're talking about defining what we're defining as a school, what is defined as an educational institution and all those things. So again, it almost sounds like it's in a preamble, but that's this what- This is um, the, the stuff that was located on page one, lines 15 through 17 and on page two in its entirety and then on page three, lines one through 19. Uh, let's see. I believe so. I'll, ch I'll take your word for it. All right. If it's the it's same thing, it doesn't look like to me it's nearly that much in the amendment. So what's different about it? Honestly, I don't know if there's anything different from it. I mean, I'm looking at 
as far, like I'm looking at section A, right, right here where it says section 236, definition of a school. I don't see any defini I don't see any difference in the definition of a school in amendment number five. It looks like we're just defining what a school is. So I don't see any difference what is, what is, there. What's found in, in this reference it makes here in RS 17236A, what is that? I don't know what that, I don't know what that statute is. I don't have it in front of me. And then RS 4037.1 through point 12. We don't know what that is either. I don't know what that is either. And then yet it, it, it also references 15, excuse me, 17529F. We don't know what that is either. Look, it, you, you, I don't have those statutes in front of me. I don't. Okay. The, the problem with that is that reference it and we don't, none of us know what this is because none of us have the statute in front of us. So uh, it's, it's well, so I think voting on an amendment here that we don't know what it is. I think every bill we bring down here references statutes. And if I came and asked the author, can they regurgitate what that statute means? I think we'd be getting the same. We'd have the same back and forth. I agree with you. I think we would, too. But that's, you know, when we have time to look at this stuff and consider it, well, we can go look those things up and know exactly what it is. Again, that's been here since Thursday. That's been here a week from today. The statutes were there a week from today. All right, so it looks like there's some legal language in that amendment on that on the on page. What is this? Uh, I guess this is page three. You're on page three. I'm on the sorry, definition page, page. On nope, page back two. On page two. Solely for purposes of compulsory attendance, a child shall be considered in attendance at the school day if the child is participating in the LA Gator Scholarship Program pursuant to RS 17437.1 at SEC. That's new language. Show me where you are. I didn't see it. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. That's the same language that was there last Thursday. Okay. Why is that? Why does that show up if it's the same, it's the same language that was in the original bill? I, is that what you're saying? Well, I, I didn't really get into this game when the original bill was filed. I got into this game last Thursday with that amendment. But, uh, you know, I don't, all I can tell you is it was the same thing that was there on Thursday. Give me an example of what a child would be doing, what they would be participating in in this LA Gator program where they would need to be, have uh, considered attending the school day. What, give me an example of what that would be. I don't know if I understand the question. So Hit this says, again. for purposes of compulsory attendance, which means the law that deals with children having to go to school, right. a child shall be considered in attendance at the day school uh, at a day school if the child is participating in the Louisiana Gator Scholarship Program pursuant to that statute. I'm assuming that statute defines what what attendance of a school is. So Why um, do we need to have them excused, I guess, would be the, uh, one way to look at it if if they are in, in this LA Gator Scholarship Program. Give me, I guess give me an example of what that would be and what they would be doing on that school day. Um, I would believe they'd be going to class if they were in school on school day. Attending class. I said it, it, they shall be considered in attendance at a, at a day school. It says they shall be considered in attendance at a day school if the child is persist, persist, participating in the LA Gator Scholarship as pursuant to RS 1740 37.1. I'm assuming that RS defines what attending a school is. I don't have it in front of me. So I guess they would, they're trying to match up saying if you're on the Gator Scholarship, how they determine someone in a public school is attending a school, they want to make sure that that applies to someone taking an ESA in a non-public school. Okay. All right, if we go down to the, to the, uh, the next section, which is 3996. All right, hold on now. Show me where you're at. No, I'm just, I don't have it on print like you do, and so I'm having to look at the computer, and it keeps jumping around on me. Hang on a second. Oh, I see what you're saying, 39.96, okay, I see what you're saying. So what is, what is this? This is some kind of exemptions. What is this about? Well, this is current law, and it, it, it addresses charter schools, exemptions, requirements, says notwithstanding any state law, rule, or regulation to the contrary, except as maybe otherwise specifically provided for it in approved charter, a charter school established and operated in accordance with the provisions of this chapter and its approved charter and the school's officers and employees shall be exempt from all statutory mandates or other statutory requirements that are applicable to public schools and to public school officers. So it looks like it's stating um, information on why charter schools are exempt from some things that public schools are required to do. 
So it says they're required to do all that except the following. And it looks like if we go down to the, to the bold highlight, the underline part there, it's number 82. So there, we know there are at least 82 exemptions, uh, exceptions to this rule. Is that what that says? I, I, I don't know. I don't have that in front of me. I don't know. All right. The next portion is 4014. It deals with student scholarship for educational excellent program and the creation of that. And, and then it says colon for termination. So we're also going to apply this to not just creation, but also the termination of this program. It says the student scholarship for educational excellence program. Oh, yeah, that is terminating the state voucher program that uh, Governor Jindal did. Okay. The state voucher, not the tax credit voucher, the state voucher. Okay. All right, what's the next part that's highlighted and underlined through the end of the 24, why, why do we have that through, just through the end of the 24-25 school year? I believe that that will mirror when phase one for this goes into effect, that, that, that this program will cease to exist. And no further scholarships will be awarded through the program. So I guess they're lining it up with phase one of this program to phase that out. All right, and it looks like six and seven are technical. Looks like changing, it. Uh, changing letters and numbers. Right, and then number eight, we're deleting lines 13. Let's see, what is that? Page four? Yeah. We're deleting lines, I got it marked here, lines 13 through 18. And that says to create an opportunity for the best and highest. That, that was, I guess they fig figured that language wasn't needed. Um, that looks kind of, I don't know, I've never seen language like that in a, st in a bill before, but um, I guess the author felt like that needed to be deleted out of that. Um, I don't really see any reason why that language would be in there. So these are the, is that the author's amendment or are these, this, or it's all part of your amendments, but it's. Well, it's part of my amendments, but I mean, I think it's a combination of a lot of stakeholders who are involved in this process, which are many. So uh, I guess they, when they asked me to get involved, they deemed that this language was unnecessary. Okay. All right, Amendment 9 says it deals with page 4, and it, you insert between lines 21 and 22. These, I guess these are more, these are like... Uh, definitions. Kind of definitions. Yes, sir. And, and tell me what this account, what the, that's a definition of. Yeah, that's a definition. What, what is, tell me what that is. It's an account for what? It's like a bank account or... Uh, well, let's read it. It says it means an education scholarship account established pursuant to this chapter composed of state funds deposited on behalf of a student eligible to participate in the program. So I would read that as that is the account that the ESA student would have that they would use to pay for tuition and then some of the other things that are laid out in this legislation. What all can they use the money to pay for? All right, I'll get to that right here. That's in one of the other amendments? Nope. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's on, it's on the next page. We'll get to it. We can get to it. All right, so account funds, and then it says the funds deposited into the account on behalf of a participating student. That's, I think that's self-explanatory. Right. You want to go to page three? Well, hang on, I lost my spot here again. Okay, Amendment 11. Oh, um, your amendment, all right, you're on page three. Page three. All right, so Amendment in, 11. In this particular one, it says parent means a parent, legal guardian, or custodian. What if you have a, a child that lives with a grand grandparent or an aunt or uncle or something like that? What do we do with those kids? I would guess that that would fall under the definition of legal guardian or custodian. I would I would imagine if you're a an adolescent and you're living with your grandparent that you would have to have some kind of designation of that person being your legal guardian or custodian because they would have to make decisions like going to the doctor, having surgery, um, and things like that. So what about people that don't have legal guardianship? Uh, is that does that fall under custodian? You mean there's a you mean a child that has no parent, no legal guardian or custodian? Well, legal guardian. If they let's say they don't have a parent, they're living with somebody besides a parent, and that person is not going through the process to become a legal guardian, which is a court process they would have to pay for to get done, and go through that process. They, let's say they haven't done that. Does that mean that they are a custodian? Man, you got me on that. I, I don't practice family law. Um, I, you know, I would think that that without any some kind of designation they couldn't even get this child uh, you know a library card or, or enrolled in a, in a public school so um, I, I would assume that that I guess adult would have to have a court 
you know, de determine whether they're a custodian and if they're applying for this and they haven't had this done at that time, I guess they would have to go get that designation. So how do, do, do they have to pay for that or is this paid for through this LA Gator program? Or I, I think the, the child, that, that's on the, the parent to have or the custodian to pay for that. I don't, I didn't see anything in this bill that would do that. So those kids wouldn't likely wouldn't be able to participate, I guess is what I'm getting at. I don't know if that kid could go to a public school. If you had no custodian, no legal guardian and no parent, I don't know how that child could enroll in a public school without having somebody designated as one of these three there, things, do you? Well, there are a lot of kids that are in school that don't live with their parents or don't have a legal guardian, but they're still in school. Maybe those, well, maybe that's considered that's a custodian. I don't know what that question is. Question for Cade Brumley, I guess. I don't know. Well, unfortunately, well, it's I, in your amendment, so that's well, why I'm asking I, you the question. I, if you're asking me that on page three line, or page four, what, page three, line four, uh, under the definition of a parent, and that I can't answer the fact that if someone doesn't have a parent, legal guardian, custodian, whether they can uh, apply to go to a school. I'll give you the I'll give you the win on that question. I don't know. <laughs> All right, participating you? school is a no. I don't. I don't. Know. Okay. I, in fact, I would assume that what you said was probably it. They're not going to be able to participate. Well, right. Unless I, they I would. Something. I don't know how you could attend just, a public school if you just showed up with no custodian, garden, or legal. I mean, how would you? Well, the, uh, like I, I said, their that kids that would, would do it, and they've been enrolled in school for quite some time. But it, this would be a, a little new program, shocking. so they would help, they would yeah, have to do that. It's a little troubling, and honestly. They would. Uh, anyway, I'm just trying to figure out because that could mean a big, a big percentage of the kids that it would otherwise be eligible for this program may not be eligible for it for that. Well, so, maybe we could ask Family Services what the percentage of kids under the poverty level that have no legal custodian, custodian, guardian, or legal, or legal parent. I don't know. Gosh. Custodian, it sounds like to me, it's kind of a catch-all, and they don't have to have any kind of legal proceedings to do that to become the custodian of it, and that may be all it is. I don't know. It might be. But it's it's important to know that because we're going to have to make a determination. Hey, I, I agree, and, and I, I can I, I know who to call to find that out. We could find that out between if it's right, then, here and uh, the next side. Participating school, participating student, uh, those, are, those are pretty straightforward. And the program means the program created by this chapter. Are there additional programs, or is it just one overall program that that's talking about? I read it as one program. <clears throat> okay. I read it as one. All right, the, the program manager means an entity selected by the State Department of Education approved by the State Board to administer the program as provided by RS 1740374. Is that, is that, who would that be? Give me an example of who that would be. Who would be eligible? I mean, you'd have to, I mean, I think that's for Bessie to determine. If I had to give you my best guess, that would be some kind of third party administrator that would come in and administrate, administer, sorry, that program. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's something for, for Bessie to determine. But I think that's what it would mean. You would hire. I guess my question on that, though, and why I'm confused on that is it says it means an entity. Well, you, a program manager, that almost seems like it's a person that would, that would actually do that. But is this some company that we're going to hire, some entity that we're going to hire to do this? I would think so, yes. Okay. I would think so. All right, and then it goes into qualified educational expenses, and it says means any of the following. Is this... Is this list uh, uh, inclusive, or, is, or could there be other things that are not specifically spelled out in here? If you look on line 29, section G, it says any other, just, yeah, it's right at the end. It says any other educational expenses approved by the state board. So I guess it is not limited to A through F if G says, you know, if the board approves another additional expense, they can do it. All right, so some of the things listed here is are tuition fees, uh, curricula and textbooks or other instructional materials, but not limited to any sub supplemental materials or online instruction required by participating schools or school providers. Is there, for the online portion of it, is that, is that something that they, can, that they qualify if they're, if they're completely online? Do they qualify as the LA Gator? I don't believe so, but... I mean, I don't see any of the, any of the, I'm reading them all now again. I wonder what that's about then, the online instruction requirement. I, I, I mean, I know that there's some schools that have some classes that might be online. Maybe they have, maybe that was put in there because of what happened with COVID. In case that happened again, then that would suffice. So um, 
I think that was smart to put that in there because you may have situations where with technology now, you might have a, a storm, you might have a flood, you might have a hurricane where they might go online for two, two months until everybody gets you know, back in their home or whatever. So I'm assuming that's, that's a catch all for that. All right, fees for the Louisiana Educational Assessment Program test. And is that, these that's are the tests? That's the LEAP test. I'm sorry? I believe that's, that's, the, that's the LEAP test, right. So, so, so now the parents are going to actually pay for the LEAP test themselves instead no, of no, the no, school no, no. paying for it? So the ESA, the, the amount of money that student gets in the bill, and I'm sure we'll get to it, they're going to have two options. They can take, the school can submit the norm test or the school can submit the LEAP test. They'll have that option. If they do the LEAP test, you can use <coughs> part of that fund to pay for the LEAP test. It's my understanding the LEAP test is not expensive. It's like $25, $30, but so now they're saying the parent doesn't have to pay for it, that they can use part of that ESA money to pay for the LEAP test. What other test? Because it, it, it talks about other types of, of things. What else can they, can they pay for out of that money? Later on, if you look, well, we'll get to it. If you look at this page. National Norm Reference right, Examination. That is the non-public version of the LEAP test. So if the private school they're going to on this scholarship, whatever, says, hey, we take the LEAP test, you can use the money to pay for it. If they say, hey, we do the norm test here, then they, so the parent doesn't have to pay for either one. What is an advanced placement examination? I don't know. I'm assuming that might be something for post well, it is. It says it right here. It related to post-secondary education. So I'm assuming that's the ACT and the SAT. It, I'm assuming that's a test where you would test into going somewhere post-secondary uh, education. And you can pay for that out of these fees? Yes. In the, in, the, in the past, before we're looking at this, weren't parents responsible for the pay, or the student responsible for the payment of, of, of those kind of tests? Non-public students? Or public students? Yes. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't have a kid in that system. I had a, I know I, I did. Okay. Um, but. All right, E says educational services and therapies included but not limited to occupational behavior, physical, speech, language, and, and audiology therapies. Are these things, are they paid for by the schools now? It's my understanding it is, and that's why it was put in there. All right, tuition and fees at post-secondary education institution providing instruction for student participating in dual enrollment. So now the, the, you can pay for dual enrollment classes out of this? Yes. And that was before, that was something that the parent had to pay for? I don't know if Well, if I do, because I paid for a lot of hours for, for dual enrollment between two kids, so. Uh, Your kids went to public school? They did. They okay. went to public school, and they, they did dual enrollment, and uh, got a lot of college credits beforehand, and I had to write the check for all of those well, things. Well, I might be in agreement with you there, that if, if the public school kids have to pay for it, then, you know, maybe that needs to be changed here, but. Um, Do we have any idea what the cost associated with that would be? Because I know it's pretty expensive. It's not as expensive if they go to the institution. The cost of college. a dual enrollment? Yeah. I don't know. I, know I couldn't tell you offhand what the, what the, what the uh, tuition is, is for dual enrollment. any kind of fiscal note in this? In well, with this? everything in this bill is subject to appropriation, so there is no fiscal note. So we'll, we'll get a, you know, if we're. If we did all of these things, though, what would the cost be associated well, with it? Well, that's, I'll get into that later. But we, we don't, well, well, we don't know. I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. Um, if you allow me to jump ahead. Sure. So in, the, in the, the, the two things that I changed, one of them was it laid out the formula on how phase one's gonna get paid for. And that original language was, um, well, first for special needs, it was 160% above the local and state MFP average, which came down to about $15,000. That's for the SPED kids. For the, for the, the kids that are 250% and below, they were using 80% of the state and local average MFP. And for the phase two, for the 400%, they were doing 55% of that. So SPED kids, 15,000. The, the kids under 250%, you're looking at about 7,600, maybe in change. For the phase two kids that are 400% above the poverty level, looking at about $5,500. We deleted all that. So what we're, what we're doing with this is saying, Bessie, y'all decide how much money you think each phase should be allocated to. Y'all decide that, and it'll come back to you and I and everybody else in this body, and we can vote it up or down. Okay, if we only do a portion of this and we, we vote a portion of it in and a portion out that we're not gonna exclude, is that 
that's something we can do as a legislature. We can by the, funding if we give them say if we give them half the money. We get to pick I, I mean, I guess, it, I guess it's kind of like tops. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't think we would go in there and just say, you know, uh, I mean, we give Bessie a lot of flexibility in the Department of Education flexibility here. I mean, I'm, I don't want to come in there and say you can use it for tuition. You can't do it. You can't do that. But I guess it'd be like tops. I mean, if, if they come with a $50 million tab and we amend that down to $25 million, they're going to have to figure out how they want to spend it, you know, and who they want to spend it on. Tops just went toward tuition, so this, somebody had to pay the other part of the tuition. That was simple, but this one has lots of very. I agree. Things it does have it, some other. It, you would have to pick and choose what you would fund if you if you're going to fund it. Let's say that the let's say the price tag is a hundred dollars, and we're going to we decide we're going to fund them fifty dollars. Well, then somebody's going to have to pick and choose what programs that's right. we fund and what we that's don't. That's right. And I think. So where that, does it in your amendments does it come? Well, I, th I think later on you see that, and in the bill that that Bessie would make those decisions. Certainly not us. So Bessie would make the decision about how much money we have to fund to the program. No, no, no. We decide. We give it to them in a block. I guess, you know, a block of money, and they would decide. You know, can they, do they have enough money to go to phase one? Do they have enough money to go to, to even, it may not even have enough money to go to phase one. I mean, if, if phase one is $50 million and we give them 10, you know, they may decide, you know, we can't, we can't do it or, or they may decide we'll do the special needs kids and then nothing more. I would rather let them decide that, not us. Well, do we um, fund any other programs like that in a similar manner? Where we, uh, I don't you know. Give them part of the money, and they have to decide how they're going to administer the program. I'm sure that I, you know, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I'm, I'm sure there's some there's in some the vast uh, spread of the of the commission administration could answer that 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 we do that somewhere. I mean, um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. All right, let's go back up there where we were. Let's go. Let's see. I think 12 is technical. All right, G under there, uh, under number nine, it says that any other educational expenses approved by the school, the state board. Is that Bessie? That's Bessie. Okay, and so they can, in addition to what's in the bill, they can they can create whatever they, could. they want to do, and 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 and, uh, and that would be they could, in. and and that's and look, a lot of this is in the original bill, so this is it's not like this amendment is everything I thought up of one night and then decided to put it on paper. So a lot of this is regurgitating what was in the original bill. Well, so yes, me, that is in there. You, t you, you said something that kind of caught my attention a while ago. You said in the two things that I've done to change this bill and you have eight pages of amendments, they only affect two things? Well, going back to killing all the trees in the paper, it reinstates a lot what was in the original bill and what was in the amendments on Thursday. The main things that we did in today are deleting the section on the procurement and deleting the, sec the section on referencing the local and the MFP and setting that scholarship amount where we're not going to set it, they're going to set it. Okay. All right, it looks like Amendment 12 is technical. I agree with that. And Amendment 13 changes survey to report. What's the, what's the purpose of that? Again, they felt that that was cleaner language. The, the, the drafters and other people involved felt that report was a better terminology than survey. Well, surveys sometimes contain information that we need to know in, in these things because they, they do a survey of it. And it tells us, you know, gives us information, whereas a report may just be something that set up that they have a the, just kind of a form they do do you know if there's any difference in those things i can tell you this the report is defined later on in the amendments okay so we can go through what the report consists of okay all right all right it deletes uh on, on amendment 14 it says it, it deletes conduct a statewide survey and insert insert collect data i guess they're trying to match that up with the word report where survey and c conduct a statewide survey are more linked terminology i think report is is uh, jives better with collect data, then conduct a statewide survey. Gotcha. All right, and then survey and report again, same thing yep. on that? Yep. All right, Amendment 16, it says program creation, administration, powers and duties, the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, the State Department of Education rules implementation. The Louisiana Giving All True Opportunity to Rise, LA Gator, scholarship program, a universal education scholarship count program is hereby created. This is just the lead in language to that, to, it, to that yes. where they're creating that, that yes. particular program? Yeah. And it says it shall administer the program in accordance with the state board rules. 
those are those state board rules created by the board itself or is that something that we create by statute i would think we create the the bessie board rules by statute maybe there's some that aren't and some that are um i can't tell you right offhand all the state board rules and whether they were created by us or them i'm assuming they have some flexibility to do some things but we probably have some things i would think it have to be in state statute okay all right then number one just determination of student eligibility those kind of things two right. on their financial audits of the program and accounts to ensure the expenditures are made in accordance with this chapter including at minimum additional random audit the are they not subject to to the uh, state audit to the state auditor they meaning who the the, the recipients of the esa this, this program i'm assuming is what it would be is it subject to be audited by the legislative auditor i would think it does um i'll have to get that get back with you on that i don't know the answer to that okay um yeah I, aren't I the authority of the department to deem any participating student ineligible in the program and that's if they become ineligible I assume. right like if they all of a sudden they uh you know they do something that that deems them ineligible maybe they go back to a public school then obviously they wouldn't be eligible so that would be an example of of being um ineligible then it goes into one of the areas that i've got lots of questions from people about asking me that i didn't nearly know the answer to it, was, it says uh, to refer cases involving the misuse of account funds to the attorney general for recovery of misused funds what's the potential for the i guess it would be the parent to to misspend the funds that they're given they're set up in this account why can they you know can they go just draw the money out and go to the casino no it's it's my understanding that the money gets put into account and then it's kind of like amazon they would go on there and say this is the proof that i paid for tuition this is the proof that i paid for this and then that money would be by the department would be allocated to pay that you know i like the language being in there and i certainly wouldn't want one single penny being used but it's my understanding they don't just get like a debit card with a bunch of money on it where they could you know go to walmart or go on a shopping spree instead of paying the tuition and that's certainly not the intent of the bill by any stretch is is it a is a reimbursement situation where the the parent has to pay it at first now they get reimbursed no i think it, it well, then you lost me tell me how that works okay i think you know the the, the jay luno account will, will that account will show up as five thousand dollars and then you would submit something saying here's a here's my uh tuition bill for thirty five hundred dollars and then the department would you know pay that money pay out. that money out and you would never get the money in your hands okay and that works pretty much on everything it's my understanding that's what it does so what about when it, i thought earlier we talked about it talked about some of the things you could spend money on like school supplies and things of that nature how, how would that work is there going to be some kind of warehouse created where this stuff is all there and they get it or i mean i don't think they can go to walmart and get it i wouldn't think I guess they would uh, maybe in that case if they bought something outside of the school like if they bought a school uniform then obviously that wouldn't be the case but if the school said you need to go and buy a number five binder blah 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 that we don't have i mean i think all these private schools now have bookstores and they all you know they all want to make money off their own stuff right so they say oh and by the way we're the only bookstore you know it's got to be this from this bookstore i can't answer that question if they buy something outside of that but I guess they would have to pay for it on their own, submit an invoice, and if it got approved, then, it, then, it, then they could get reimbursed. Okay. Next one is the establishment of an online anonymous fraud reporting service. Is that something that the, the that would, we'd have to pay for out of the state general fund, or is that something they're going to pay for out of the money that's put in this program, or, or Bessie, or how does that work? It's my understanding that that would have to come out of Bessie's, um, that they would have to pay for that. Okay. And are there any other requirements other than just establishing it? Is there, they, do they have to review so many cases? Do they have to have certain uh, employees? Or is I don't there know. Any, any other requirements for that? I haven't seen anything in, in uh, I, I could probably read the, I know more about this than the actual bill. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen anything in there. I'm not saying it's not in there. It could be, but I haven't seen it. Are requiring a surety bond or a letter of credit for participating schools or service providers that have been operating for fewer than three years that receive more than one hundred thousand dollars in account funds in school year does this mean that the 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 school has been operating for less than three years or their program has been operating for I, less than three years i think the school okay why, why we have that in there i think they're worried about you know startups you know schools that may not that are that are obviously have, have haven't been around longer than three years so you know maybe they're not financially uh secure and, and solvent as 
maybe Episcopal of Baton Rouge or Catholic of New Iberia, schools that have been there for decades. You know, okay. I like that in there. I think, I think that's a good thing. All right, the establishment of a standardized appeals process for student schools and service providers, that is, uh, is that for the, the standardized appeals process, that's for whether or not that, they can spend the money on something or not? Or what, what's, what's, what are they? That, what, are they uh, that, what I appreciate is if a student gets removed from the program, for whatever reason, and they decide to appeal, they would appeal to Bessie, and they would have an appeals, Bessie needs to come up with appeals process if someone thinks they were wrongly removed from the ESA program. Okay. You know. A rolling enro uh, enrollment process, what is that? That's a number seven, A. My appreciation would be, let's say you have 500 students, so say you only have money for 250, the 250 that maybe were the applied after the first 250 would roll over to the next year and get priority as those funds were made available. That's the way I appreciate it. Okay. B1, the department shall inform parents of a participating student at the time of his initial entry in the program at the beginning of the student's school year in, in grades 8 through 12 of the eligibility requirements of TOPS for students participating in the program. Is TOPS available for these kids that are in, in high school, I guess? Would be oh, yeah. Age? Yeah, TOPS would be available for them. All right, do you know what that RS-1759F uh, is? I do not. All right, this, the department shall begin enrolling participant students not later than March 1st, 2025 for the 2025-26 school year. That would be the first year this program is available? Yes. And then it goes on to say that, it, that for accounts where their, their funds would be used to pay more than one participating school or service provider, the department shall have until March 1st, 26 to begin enrollment of those students for the 26-27 year. How is it that you would pay money to more than one participating school? I guess it would be if you switch schools mid-year. You know, how do if you, you collect the money back from the school that you've already paid? Well, that's a good question. I think... You got a good answer for me? <laughs> Whew, let's see. So if you pay the full two, well, I'll say this. From my, from my experience in private schools, we didn't pay the full tuition right off the bat. We paid it in the first, you know, the, the first part of the school year, then the second part. So that would take care of itself if they, maybe the private school demanded, hey, we want full tuition up front, then, you know, I guess that's what it's referencing. But you know, I, I don't, I certainly, like you, I don't want to see the school get money they don't deserve. So maybe that's something we need to look at between here and the, uh, when it gets over on the House side. I'll certainly make a note of that. All right, so the provisions of this chapter shall be subject to spe specific appropriation of funds by the legislature each year for the purpose of 4037.6 account fund. Correct. That means that we get to determine how much money we'll put into this program. Yes. Is there a minimum amount of funding that we need to do for this program to kick it off? You know, that would be a, I guess after, after Bessie does their, cert, their sorry, report, <laughs> when they do all that, because if, when we get into the report later, it says they want to determine how many kids are in, how many kids are in the schools that are participating, how many kids are fall below the 250% above the poverty level. Once they determine all that, I would assume, I would assume they would make that determination on what that minimum is. But if you're asking me what that minimum is, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. All right, and then it goes on to say that the department on a quarterly basis shall allocate to each account from funds appropriated or otherwise made available from the program. So I, I assume that means that Bessie would allocate funds appropriated or otherwise. So Bessie would allocate who gets what funds? I guess what I'm trying to figure out is if we, if we only appropriate enough money, say, to cover 25% of the expense, how do we run the program? Hey, I, that, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I think that's that's something for uh, that uh, people smarter than me need to answer. Um, you know, uh, obviously, we you know we're not going to allocate. Uh, this is what I think is going to happen. They're going to do the report. They're going to see how many kids they think will be will, will sign up for this, and they can look at stats. I know there's. Stats in other states, I think it's 10, n no more than 10% of the public school students in the other states that have ESAs sign up for these that are in public schools. 
So, you know, once they do that, they look at the survey, they're gonna get an idea. Let's say they come to us and say, hey, we need $50 million, and this body in the House decides, you ain't getting $50 million, you're getting $30 million, then they're gonna have to decide how that money's gonna get spent. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just going because I don't know either, and I'm just trying to figure out how that's possible I mean, to get this program up. I mean, I don't know if you do it on a first come, first serve, who signs up first, and then that's why they have the rollover provision. You know, um, that's something that, that you know, we're going to have to decide as legislators, you know, how much we want to fund them, and they're going to have to prove that this, these amount of kids that they think will sign up and, and go from there. Because I've heard, I've heard the same conversations about first come, first serve, and I guess that's as fair a way as any to do it, but the question that comes to me is that if you do it that way, how is the school gonna function? Because, I mean, only maybe only a few of their students are eligible for the funding and the others aren't. I mean, how, how would that well, work? Well, you mean you're assuming a school, a private school has a vast majority of their student population has ESAs? Correct. Right, thank you. Um, I, think, I think you're gonna have, uh, Again, all the statistics show the states that have the ESAs, that, you know, it's, it, it's just a small amount. You know, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I think a, a state, a school would be foolish to go, if they have, you know, 300 kids and they go sign up 250 ESA kids, I think that's a little foolish. I don't even know if they, you know, if that would even be feasible, but. Do you think it's, it would be possible for any of the, the schools to kind of recruit kids that are, that are uh, in this LA Gator program to get them to come to their schools? I would, I, I, I can't speak for them. I just didn't know if that would be a fair, I mean, that may be a very fair way to do it or not, I just don't know. I, I, I mean, I would, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak for, for what a school's administration would do when this program, if this bill gets signed into law. It says the department shall implement a system for parents to direct funds from accounts to participating schools and service providers for qualified education expenses by electronic or online funds transfer. Uh, what do you do in the areas where, where we don't have internet and they don't have the availability to do electronic or online fund transfers? Um, well, I'd ask Senator Mizell if she was here. Um, I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. I mean, I, I can't imagine that. Uh, I mean, I know there are areas that have that have um, connectivity problems. Um, I don't know, but, the, but that's a good question because there might be somebody that that doesn't have that. So we'd have to, you know, we'd have to address that. All right, it says the system shall also allow parents to publicly rate, review, and share information about participating schools and provide service providers. Is that like an online thing that they would do, or that's my appreciate appreciation of it, and I think that ties into the accountability um, aspect of it. I mean, obviously a parent could, you know, go post something on their Facebook page and do it on their own. I think it holds a little more weight if on the, you know, the Bessie's website and you have parents that are at this school and saying, hey, this school's terrible, this school's not teaching my kid. So I think that's a, a nice little accountability piece. So you know, I mean, they're gonna obviously, the, the, they're gonna have accountability with their feet. I mean, if they wanna, if they're not like it, they're gonna leave. But Look, I like it having this, and you know that way they can, uh, on a more official forum, disclose their or, or express their disdain or their, you know, their issues with that school. I mean, I, I guess the the other question that comes to mind to that is that you you see all of this stuff online where people make all these outrageous comments mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Who, who, you know, who polices something like that? Who, is that something the school has to do? Will Bessie do that? I, I'm, I, I'm sure it's not the school. I would, I would think it'd be Bessie would have to decide what is uh, maybe vulgar or improper or, or, you know, um, inappropriate, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Who pays for that such that, that program like that? I, my appreciation that Bessie, that Bessie will. You know, I, and look, I, I don't know this. There might be something that Bessie has now where kid, where parents and kids can rate the public schools. Do you know if there, I don't know if there is. I don't, I, I that don't would, know either. That, that might be a, a Pandora's box to start that, but uh, there might be, I, I could right, find that Then it that says the you. department shall continue to allocate funds to an account until any of the following occurs, at which point the account shall be closed and refunds 
return to the state general fund. So how does that work? We, if, they, if there's something happens with one of these accounts, they take that whatever money's left in there and they send it back to the state general fund? They send it to the treasurer or something? Let's see. It says state general fund. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Maybe for you. I don't, I, I wouldn't I don't know. I never served on finance or appropriations. If I got, if I got ten thousand dollars left in my account and, and my kid goes to a different school and they're not eligible anymore, I got I got to figure out how to pay the state general fund. No, because you draw off of that money as needed. So you're not gonna you're not coming out of pocket. Um, just those funds that that are on your you know electric card or your online account, whatever, would go back to the general fund. Okay. All right, then B under that, it says the department determines that a, that a parent has failed to comply with the provisions of this chapter of the state board rules pertaining to the program, which include, but not limited to the determination that a parent has misused account funds. What, what is an example of how they could misuse these account funds? Because we, we talked about how they pay money to the school or a service provider, or maybe getting uh, school supplies. Would that be about I would, I would guess where, I mean, it says here, the parent withdraws the student from the program. Maybe they don't notify the proper people for that. The student graduates from high school, maybe they fraudulently turn in documentation saying that their child is still enrolled in that school. Um, the account has been inactive for two consecutive years unless inactivity is due to lack of available funding for accounts. So I think, I think they list those things. And look, you know, there's gonna be um, unintended consequences and things that they're gonna have to come up. We're probably gonna have to be doing legislation to tweak this probably until you and I are gone from here. But okay. um, I, think, I think those are some examples of, of the way that, that could be, you know, submitting documents saying, hey, my kid's going to school here next year when they're not. All right, then it says, no account funds shall be refunded, rebated, or shared with a parent or student in any manner. What does that mean? I think that means that if there is money refunded, rebated, that you don't, that money just stays in that electronic account. You don't get, you don't get that money in your hand. What, but what would be an example of that money being refunded or rebated? You know, I read, I, I, that's why I highlighted it. I, I don't know what an example of that would be. Um, I'm glad the wording's in there, but because, because if, it was, if it was refunded, I don't know how they would get it. I mean, I guess. I might be glad it was in there too if I knew what it meant. I mean, I guess if it was, um, you know, maybe if you brought a school uniform and then you decided to, you know, switch your school, your kid to a new school in the spring semester, and, uh, or, or maybe you, you got the uniform, then the school said, we're not doing uniforms anymore, and you, that money was refunded. You know, I guess there's different scenarios where that might come into account, I don't, I don't know. Okay. All right, now there's a provision in here further down on line 34, it, it says the student was enrolled in a public school for the previous school year. That makes them automatically eligible to be in this program? I believe so under phase one. I'm trying to see what line, what line was that? On 34 and 35? Yeah. What if they were in a, in the, in a private school? Then they're not eligible in phase one or phase two. Just briefly, tell me what the sure. phase, different so phase, phases are. Phase one, my appreciation, are kids that are already in the state voucher program. That's one criteria. One, they're in a public school. Two, they're entering kindergarten. And they all have to be, they can't have an, a, a, a household income above the 250% above the poverty level. That's phase one. Phase two is obviously phase one, and then they go a step further, and they go 400% above the poverty level. And I'm sorry, the special ed kids are in phase one too. Phase three is universal. That's, uh, well, my kid's out of high school now, but that would be a kid in a, in a public school, private school. 
It says here in the third phase, the student is initially eligible if the student meets the requirements of paragraph one of the subsection. In this phase, first priority shall be granted to the following groups of students of equal consideration be given to each group. And then it says students who meet the criteria provided in 174031B2. What, do we have any idea what that is? I do not. And then qualification to participate in school choice programs for certain students with exceptionality. Do we know? Right. Is, maybe that's what the title 17 law is. Probably. Okay. Probably. And again, I apologize for not knowing that statute. And then the B section on page five down at the bottom, that's just saying that the, they're, they're not violating uh, compulsory school attendance laws if they attend a school through this voucher program. Is that, what that, is that what that's saying? I believe so, yes. Now this one, it, it goes on to talk about how the, the the participating student who fails to comply with the attendance requirement shall be reported to the state director of child welfare and attendance. I thought there is there. I thought there was mandatory reporting to. Uh, I don't know if it's Department of Children and Family Services or law enforcement or who. Is that not? Does, does that not apply to them? I don't know. I'm assuming that's that's language from what they have to do at a non at a public school. I don't know. I don't know. And here it says that a participating student is eligible to participate in the program through in-person education, virtual education, or a hybrid approach that combines both methods. Is that something that Bessie makes those determinations about what kind of program they have? That's my appreciation of it, yeah. And a student shall not participate in this program concurrently with a home study program approved by the state board or a home study program registered with the department as a non-public school not seeking state approval. Does that mean that they can't do a hybrid of those? They can't do part of the, that's, the school and then do the home that's part homeschooling? The way I read it, yeah. All right, why don't you just hit these others a little bit for me? Sure. Tell me what they mean. Some of them are pretty self explanatory. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, right below it, where you stopped off is is the eligibility of a school. So we go through, you know, what what deems a school eligible, and then um, now this is if if uh, under D one to be eligible to participate in the program. Yeah, line thirty three. Okay, to be eligible to, to uh, participate in the program, a non public school or service provider shall apply to participate in the program, and if determined to be eligible, accept account funds for presiding services, et cetera. Th does this? Public schools are automatically eligible, correct? And that's why the non-public schools are listed here? Yeah, it's saying that if you're deemed an eligible school and you sign up for the program, then you, you're you eligible to accept the account funds for the providing services covered as the qualified educational expenses. Okay. Education expenses. Then at 4A on line 52, it says, nothing in this chapter shall be deemed to limit the independence or autonomy of any participating public non-public school or service provider or to make the actions of a non-public school or service provider the actions of the state government. What is the purpose for that? All right, let me read that again. I got, I got you. I got you. I'm on it. 52 through 55. 4A, right? Yes. Okay. I guess it's 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 leaving the the, the non-public schools with their independence and their autonomy, um, you know, dealing with their admission standards and their criteria for for being a student at that school. You know, I mean, I guess some people, some schools have different criteria. They might say, you know, you got to do certain things, and they want to make sure that those non-public schools get to maintain that. All right, and then B, participating non-public schools and service providers shall be given maximum freedom to provide for the educational needs of participating students without governmental control. What does that mean? That's probably eye candy for the schools that want to sign up for, for ESAs. They, I, I bet someone said, you better have that in there or nobody's going to sign up for it. Might have been the Freedom Caucus Amendment. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. you, know, you can't say that anymore.
This says no participating non-public school or service provider shall be required to alter its creed, practices, admission policies, or curricula in order to accept count funds. What do, do these schools, is it not like a situation where you have a quasi-public entity and they have to provide by constitutional mandates and those kind of things versus, versus one that's not a public entity but a private entity does not have to adhere to some of I those principles? It might be. I mean, I think it's the same language that, like, the tax credit voucher used. You know, as long as they're Bessie Board approved and they're Broomfield Dodd compliant, you know, they don't discriminate in anything, and they can maintain, you know, their their creeds, their, their admissions policy and all, and their curricula, you know, that they don't have to change anything they're doing now, which they're already approved to be a school in Louisiana, that they don't have to change anything like that in order to accept an ESA student as long as they stay Broomfield Dodd compliant and so on. Again, probably language that they wanted in there, you know, to. All right, C1 says a participating school may adhere to its own admission policies in considering the admission of students participating in the program. What if you have a school that, that is a Christian-based school and they don't uh, accept Muslim kids? Is that not going to be I think that is Broomfield Dodd. I think you run afoul of Broomfield Dodd to do that. I don't think you can discriminate. Does this provision allow that? I mean, it, it No, looks like because it, it doesn't supersede Broomfield Dodd. I mean, um, uh, you don't think it? I think it does. You don't think it does? So you're telling me that there are school, private schools that are that are approved by Bessie that are Broomfield Dodd compliant, which is every private school that they discriminate based on religion? Well, what I'm saying is they they may require that they may not discriminate based on religion, but they, they may tell, uh, for example, a Muslim kid that you got to come to a Christian church service because everybody has to go to a Christian church service because it's a Christian school and they have the right to do that. There there might be. I mean, I, I know that uh, when my child went to an Episcopal school, they were required to go to Episcopal services. So you're right. They may, if, if you know, uh, if you go to, to John Curtis Christian School in my district, you know, they have church services and if you don't want to do it then don't go to that school you know you're getting into the weeds on Broomfield Dodd and I don't I can't regurgitate that That's right. um, even though my great uncle was the Dodd in Broomfield Dodd I, I can't uh, <laughs> by marriage um, I can't uh, you know I, I don't again we're, we're not doing anything different from schools that are already, already licensed here and approved here by Bessie and Broomfield Dodd compliant so all right, and then the next portion of it get, talks about that they shall develop the, the process for the annual administration of the following for participating students, English language arts, mathematics, et cetera. That's kind of that's, typical of what you would see in any. That's any, the LEAP test. Yeah. All right, what is the, the part in, under reports on line 50? What are those reports that it's discussing there that they have to submit to the Senate Educational Committee, et cetera? Okay, um, so number one would be the total number of students participating in the program. So that's every kid that's on an ESA scholarship, whatever you want to call it. A list of the participating schools and service providers. These are the list of the schools that are accepting these, these ESA students. Total student enrollment of each participating school. So you can see what percentage, you know, if a school has 10% ESA kids or 50%, whatever, I don't think it'll be 50%. Um, percentage of total enrollment of each school represented by the program, there you go. Aggregate test results, data, result data for participating students. So that's important because every student who's on an ESA, just like with the tax credit voucher that have to take the LEAP test, those scores are gonna be published. So you can have accountability and see, well, this school over in whatever parish, you know, has 15 kids and none of them can pass the, you know, uh, scored, they all scored very poorly. And then as, as the rules we covered earlier, Bessie may deem those schools ineligible. Or that would be good questions for us on finance and appropriations, the joint budget, where we could say, you know, I'm not gonna, con you know, if Bessie didn't do their job and say, hey, we're kicking these schools out, they're ineligible, then that's another catch-all where we can say, look, I'm looking at these test scores and why am I appropriating money to you to send it to schools that are obviously um, not helping kids, so that's important. I so think. this would this would allow us to track and report the success or failure of kids that are in this. In this Absolutely, program. not by name, right? Obviously, yeah. but yeah. 
And I think that's very so important. One of the criticisms I've heard about this is that people believe that it may take the, the, the I don't want to say the best and brightest, but, but the higher achieving kids and, and put them in a situation where uh, they're involved in this program and it takes away from the public schools. You know, my research and experience with vouchers and, and you know, I, I wrote that, uh, you know, I had a, a lot of to do with the tax credit voucher bill and, um, you know, that was kind of something I had dived into before I got typecast as an insurance guy, but typecast. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, 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 I can't speak for ESAs and, and there is data out there and I haven't looked at it, but, but most of the voucher kids are the lowest performing kids because the, the kids that are happy, that are doing well, they don't want to leave. They don't want to leave their public school. But to, to, if your question is, is there scenarios where the best and the brightest might say, hey, I want to move to this school because it's Catholic and I'm Catholic? Yeah, I think that's going to happen. So these don't apply to kids that are in public school at all? They can't, get, they can't participate in this program if they get, attend a public school? No, 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 no. The only way you're, you're in phase one, the only way you're eligible is if you're a non-public school kid, you're entering kindergarten, and you're 250% below the poverty level, or you're in the state voucher system, and to be in the state voucher system, you had to come from a public school, same criteria. Year two, same thing, you gotta be coming from a public school, but it raises that 250 to 400. Now, phase three, that's wide open. That's wide open. What is this part on uh, Section 5029, Alternative uh, Initial Eligibility Requirements? What is that about? I thought the eligibility requirements are in the first part. You know what? I'm not sure what this is. Hang on. So it says a student participating in the LA Gator Scholarship Program is provided in Chapter 43C of right, this title right. shall be eligible to receive an award pursuant to this chapter if he qualifies as follows. The participating student has graduated from a public or approved non-public high school. We're giving them some kind of money after they graduate from high school? You know, Senator, I'm going to have to get back with you on that one. I don't, I'm not sure what that means. I, don't, I must have missed that. Any other participating student has been certified by a parent? Let's see. Successfully, like you said, completed the 12th grade level. I'm not, I, I need to find that out for you. I will find that out for you. What I mean, that, I, what that I, part means. I have means. no idea what that means. I don't but either. It looks like to me we're going to give them money from this program if they graduate from uh, a high school and they've been involved in this program. I don't know why I mean, we I don't give know kids if it's some kind of school. Why well, we would give them money. I need to find that out for you. And okay. I'll and I know who to call and I can find it out for you real quick. All right, thank you. Okay. Senator, Senator Bowie for the a question on the amendment. Members, we are still on the amendment. Senator, I just have uh, one question, a really clarification. In, uh, I think it's amendment number five, section 3996, charter schools exemptions and requirements. Okay, which question? What's the purpose for, for putting that exemption in for the charter school? I'm not sure. I know. I know. It's just reinstating existing law. Um, you know that that's already in the original bill, so I'm not as familiar with that as some of the other things. But um, I can find that out for you. I don't know. Okay. Because the reason I'm asking, as you know, uh, the body voted to end the 18-year experiment, and so once the governor that's signs right. uh, that bill. Louisiana will no longer have a charter experiment 
After spending $10 billion, we can expect from the Louisiana Department of Education that final report so we can know what has happened. But the reason we had the exclusion for charters for the last 18 years is because they were experimental. So now that they're not experimental, we should be concerned that we are now exempting them, especially the language that says the following. Can you help me understand this part? It says, notwithstanding any state law, rule, or regulation to the contrary, and except as may be otherwise specifically provided for an approved charter, a charter school established and operated in accordance with the provisions of this chapter and its approved charter and the school's officials and employees shall be exempt from all statutory mandates or other statutory requirements that are applicable to public schools and public schools officials. And as you know, charter schools are also public schools. Secondly, the officers and employees of the charters are private contractors. So why would we not now hold them to the same accountability standards that we're holding our public school officials and schools? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I'm not familiar with the transition of and the consequences of that bill you mentioned, you know, where we're transitioning out of that. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I think that's, that's a critical one for us because okay. we, we don't want to continue allow the non-accountability part now, now that we no longer have an experimental right. charter program. Right. Was that question answered in committee? No, Did no, they I don't, touch I don't on that? think it was ever asked okay. because, you know, as you said, I know I'm not on education anymore. We wrap, I don't know if you we are. wrap the exclusion I understand. because the charters were experimental, so we allowed them to do okay. what they were supposed to do. I'll to. try to find that out All for right. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Senator Price for an amendment. Question on the amendment, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my amendment is, I mean, my question. No. All right. This is right here about the uh, children with exceptionality. And it says if a participating student enrolling in a participating non-public school would have been entitled to receive special education services in the residence school, his parents shall acknowledge in writing as part of the program enrollment process that the parents agreed to accept only such services as are available to all students enrolled in a participating school. I think what that means is if you have a private school and you, have, you don't have uh, programs or um, what's, the, what's the word they used? Exception. For exceptionalities, that if a, if a kid with exceptionalities wants to come to that school, you don't have to go and create all those things. I mean, I guess the, the parent would know best for their kid. And if they say, look, I want that kid to go to this school, even though they don't have all those programs for, for special needs kids with exceptionalities, you can't force the private school to come up with those things. That's really a choice of the parent that if they want to, you know, if the parent seems uh, their wish is to have the kid go to the school, even though they don't have those services, then that's, that's the choice of the parent. But in the bill itself, it also says that you cannot discriminate against kids with exceptionality. Isn't that the form of discriminating if, but we, if they don't have the service, you can't go? We have that now. I mean, we have like my, my uh, the At the private school, not in the public school. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's up to the parent. I mean, the parent can make that, I mean, they know what's best for their child, but I mean, right now, if you have a private school that doesn't provide those services and a kid with special needs shows up at the doorstep and they say, hey, you know, you can come here, but I mean, we, we, we can't provide these services. I don't think that's discriminatory. Because it's really no, no change than, than the private sector now. That's right, so, but the private sector now don't get public dollars. Well, that's, that's uh, I mean, we do the same thing with the voucher program, you know, so that's already, there's a precedent there, but, you know, um, I, 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 I'm not going to argue that the schools may not provide those services, but, you know, that's up to the parent. The parent knows best, we'll let the parent choose. So, getting taxpayers' dollars to go to a school, and now you're saying it's not discriminatory, 
because they're going to be known in advance? That's, that's, that's the answer to the question. My answer to your question is I don't believe that's they're acting in a discriminatory manner if they go through the scenario you're laying out. I don't well, think it's discriminatory. In the public school system, if a kid have a special, a special need because of the fact they, they have to provide that service, and now you're going to do a private school to, 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 to be able to go to or take taxpayer dollars and go to, and you're going to say they don't have to provide that service. Well, but they're not getting they're not getting the money for that service. In other words, if if it is a so right now, I think what what Bessie said they needed probably about fifteen thousand dollars to to for the special needs kids. If they go to a private school that provides those services, they get fifteen thousand dollars. If they go to a school that doesn't have it, and let's say that scholarship amounts seventy five hundred, they're getting seventy five hundred. So the school is not going to get the balance because they're not providing the service. But look, there's public schools that provide special needs services and ones that don't. So if a kid goes to a public school and says, hey, I want to go here, we don't provide special needs, that's not discriminatory. No more is it discriminatory if someone who lives in Jefferson Parish at a public school wants to go to a public school in Mandeville because it's an A-rated school and they say you can't go here because where you go is determined by your, your mailbox, where your address is, that's not discriminatory. No, but you, what you just said was at a public school, if they don't have the service, at a public school, they have to offer service. Every single public school yes, offers if, full disability services? If you go to a public school, they have to provide that service. Well, I didn't know that. But to answer your question, I don't believe it's discriminatory. Well, that's just the point that needs to be made and brought out. Thank you. Thank you. I see no more questions on the amendment. Is there any objection to the adoption of the amendment? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. My bad. My bad. My bad. My bad. Senator Jackson for the floor on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I passed out a document earlier that's on your desk because what's included in this amendment is an amendment that a majority of the Senate voted on last week to ensure that um, we had accountability in the state of Louisiana for this program. And a number of people who are not members of the legislature said that this amendment that we're about to strip off the bill if you vote yes for the current amendment we on was not current law. I have a copy of that amendment on top and I have the rules and regs for the voucher program afterwards. And then I have the statue attached there too for the voucher program. And I wanted us to be clear on what we're voting on. Because the simple truth is everything that's in the, my amendment that was previously adopted, that if you vote in favor of this amendment, you will be removing, is the accountability that is currently in place for vouchers. And I researched and pulled all these documents that staff used to draft this amendment so that you could see it for yourself. Now, there's a number of issues with this amendment, but I think the time has been well spent on other issues. Because my issue as a former classroom teacher is the level of accountability. Louisiana has moved up to number 40th in the nation in education, and some say it's no, nothing to celebrate. But after being 50th for so long, we have to realize and acknowledge that we're doing something right on the path to bringing all children in the state of Louisiana out of a failing system. Not just those that attend private schools, but the public schools too. And when we acknowledge that, the question is, if you vote for the bill, you know, I'm, I'm not, but you may. <laughs> but if you vote to remove accountability, how will we know what works? If this is a great idea, then accountability in the voucher program will follow this program. And guess what accountability will show? That you were right if you support the bill and I was wrong. And I've never been bothered by being wrong and admitting I'm wrong when something advances our children and their ability 
to feed this economy when they're grown, and to live out the American dream. But it's just simple. With no accountability, of lack of accountability, when, you, when we usurp our duties to our district to at least, at the minimum, keep the same accountability on the program that's on the program that's being merged into this program, that's at issue. I, I've never understood why someone would be afraid of, account of, an account, uh, for afraid of accountability with a great idea. The only reason you skirt accountability is because you're still questionable on whether it's a great idea. So I rise in opposition to this amendment because I originally came up and asked us to do, uh, divide amendment number two from this set of amendments. Because accountability is a different debate on whether we pass ESAs or not. Accountability should be on every state dollar that is spent. And there shouldn't be a different level of accountability. Now, what's in a voucher program is different from what public schools have in accountability. But what did it give us that this bill doesn't, that this amendment doesn't? Because I've read the so-called accountability um, provisions in this amendment. It gives us a true grade on the cohorts, and I know we call them cohorts, but those are our students, and how well they're doing in a program. I, I don't understand for the life of me why we are shunning away from having the knowledge base that we need to determine if what we're doing for our students is right. So the accountability amendment just clearly does this. It gives us what we need in two or three years to determine whether we should shift more money to the ESA program or whether we should shift more money to the school public school system. Because if you look at this amendment, you are going to be asked that every year. Every year, we're going to have to determine the budget for ESAs, for public schools, but the difference between the voucher program and this program, if this amendment passes, is that you don't know how well students are performing. So we fund the budget blindly, not knowing whether we're helping students or hurting them. We don't do that in public schools, and I never thought we should. I never fought accountability in public schools, because these are our kids. This is not about political party. This is not about what area of state we're from. This is about kids. And so I'm having a hard time understanding why would we be fighting the same accountability that's attached to the voucher program, that same accountability that allows the state of Louisiana constituents and us to receive a report to determine how well a program is doing and how we move forward. So let's separate whether you love ESAs, whether you love vouchers, from whether you really want to know how a program is performing. Because this amendment strips that accountability. This amendment doesn't say that there's going to be a cohort or a report. And, and I hear in the background it's not true. I've read the amendment. I've had time to read it. And what the amendment says is the school will set up some criteria. The voucher program right now, if you go to page seven, lines 50 through 54, these students will only be tested on English language arts and mathematics. Currently in our accountability system, students are tested on English, math, civics, biology. Civics is the new test. So I don't understand why we're putting, if, if Bessie is going to decide what the account, accountability should be, I don't understand page seven, lines 52 through 54. That narrows what type of test, what subject matter test will be given on. 
We didn't do that for public education. What we said was, Bessie, you determine what you test on. So yeah, this is a narrow set of accountabilities. There's no language in any accountability statute or promulgated rules by Bessie that says we only test students on English and mathematics. I have a ninth grader. He just went through his testing period. He took English, he took math, he took biology because he's taken 10th grade class biology. And for the first time he took, I think it's like a, forgot what they call it, but the first time he took civics. It didn't count, but it gave the school a, a brief view into how civics will count next year. But in this accountability, for the first time, and it's different from what I saw in the last amendment, it restricts testing to only English language and mathematics. If you go down that same page on line seven, since everyone says there's no difference, because it is here. Lines 57, 58, it says, upon approval by the state board, a participating non-school may select an assessment, non-public school may select an assessment that is substantially aligned with its program of study and that is to be administered to participating students. We are leaving the schools to select what the assessment looks like. The voucher program, if you look at my bill I passed out to you, I pulled it directly from there, doesn't leave the school to decide which, ass which assessment they take. It also doesn't narrow down what subjects they test in. And this is not true accountability. Because the two differences, the major two differences in this amendment we just received tonight is this. You're only, te you're only testing in English and mathematics, and then the school selects the assessment. So you're going to have varying degrees of assessment all over this state for an ESA program. That's a reality. Because whatever assessment the school selects, that non-public school, so throughout our districts, the assessment is going to be different. Because each non-public school, after Bessie promulgates the rules, will decide what the assessment is. Now, how is that true accountability? And that's why I rise in opposition to this amendment probably wouldn't have rose at all had we not taken out accountability and came up with something that we said at the mic was the same, but when you dig into the weeds of it, you realize that Bessie won't decide assessment. Each non-public school will. And maybe we're okay with that today, but we shouldn't be. We shouldn't pretend that we're attaching accountability to a bill that we're not. I tell you what, no one in this room, not even the public school supporters, would go for attaching accountability that says every school across this state could pick, pick their assessment. I'm not telling you what I want to tell you. I read the bill to you. I read the provisions in the amendment because it's just in black and white. And we can't debate with black and white. There is not one school right now, whether they receive vouchers or whether they're, they're a public school in this state, that select their assessment. But if we pass this amendment, there will be. So there's no real accountability when everybody gets to pick how they're assessed. That's not true accountability. We be screaming bloody murder if we pass this for public schools and next year all of their scores went up. You know what we'd be saying? If I could pick my own assessment, my scores would go up drastically next year. That's not accountability. If you, if you want the program, that's fine. But want to know whether students are doing well or not so you'll know what to fund. So I rise in opposition to this amendment. I'm gonna keep coming to this mic today even though I'm not feeling well, because what's more important than any differences we have 
is whether we can measure the true success of our students and whether we know what to fund each year and how to push our students to realizing the same dreams and goals that we've accomplished by being in this chamber. We need to know. Senator Mizell for the floor on the amendment. Members, I, I, I know we're tired. I, I just want us to think about what we're doing here. We're so protective of a system that even though there are some good bright spots, we keep defending a system that has failed a generation and we're so afraid to give kids an option. I'm baffled by this. I, the amendment may not be perfect, no offense to Senator Talbot, but if we can provide an option, and, and I know we've talked about this, I know some people have A and B districts, that's great, but we're here for the whole state. When we vote on an LED bill, we're voting for the whole state. We've got pockets of kids without the funding to go to a, a school to give them an opportunity and ESAs are, that's just a letter to me. Opportunity is what I'm talking about. Opportunity, those kids I keep telling y'all about that, and, and, and uh, to Senator uh, Andrew's point, we can't take the same test. Schools have incredible curriculums that perform well for them that we're trying to let kids who've been in failing schools get into. How can we expect a, a school who's been on a classics curriculum to give a test from a totally different curriculum. It's not fair to anybody. And it doesn't give us an answer. We're, we're trying to find some false security saying that everybody's gotta take the same test when we know we have schools that have excelled for a long time that have proof of their outcomes if we just take them for what they've been able to do instead of trying to put a measure of a school system that has been failing on that successful school. It makes no sense to me. When, when my little charter school in Bogalusa opened, their first cohort were incredibly failing. I mean, they, they were an F their first year because you know what? Where did those kids come from? They came, those third graders came from a school that had been in decline, that the kids were not reading. How can we expect moving kids who have not been given the education they deserved into a new school, but we're gonna expect that school to outperform the failing school. It's not reasonable. There's got to be time that we invest in this to give those kids the opportunity to, to bring those grades up. That charter school now is the highest performing school in the district. That didn't happen by magic. They took those kids that were failing and made that happen. I, I, I just wanted to uh, share that. I, I think we've got such an opportunity here. I, I just feel like there are kids waiting for this, and I just hope we don't fail them. Thank y'all. I see no more questions on the amendment. I see no one for the floor for the amendment. Is there any objection to the adoption of the amendment? Okay, Senator Jackson has objected to the amendment. Members, uh, Senator Talbot has brought an amendment which Senator Jackson has, a, is, has, a, has opposed. No, you don't need to run. All in favor of the amendment will vote yes. All opposed to the amendment will vote no. Madam Secretary, open the machines. Vote your machine, members, vote your machines. Vote your machines. Madam Secretary, close the machine. 25 yeas and 14 nays, and the amendment's been adopted. Next amendment. No further amendments. Senator Seabaugh to... Okay, hold on. <laughs> amendments. Am I 
Amendments sent up by Senator Jackson, they are set number 3787, 3787. On your amendments. Members, what I did, after talking to some members, my amendment that was our amendment that was voted on by a majority of the Senate on last week, there was some aches about the last two that was taken straight from uh, the rules and regulations of Bessie that would have said that a um, when a school had to stop taking the essays, I removed those. So my amendments would add some additional accountability to the bill. The first, A, is already in Bessie rules. B, keeps the cohort so we can get an accurate report of how students are doing. And that's already in the rules that I attached to, well no, that's in the statute. So B comes directly from the voucher statute. That's what's in our law. And C talks about the uh, corresponding letter grade for that cohort. Cohort means the students that receive vouchers. It will now mean the students that receive ESAs. This is the standard minus the last two I took out for vouchers. Does nothing different, but it takes away putting in law when a school has to stop receiving ESAs when their cohort is not achieving. And so it's simple. I ask for favorable passage because this will still give us a measurement to go by of how our students are performing. Senator Cathy for a question on the amendment. Thank you. All right, look, I appreciate what you're trying to do here, but so you're taking what is essentially Bessie policy and trying to codify it into law because what, what you're proposing is not, is not in law. This is policy that Bessie could change. For example, in June, Bessie is going to be adopting new school performance standards. And so if we have this in law and it conflicts with what Bessie may adopt in June, we're, we, you've got problems. Number B is the statute. A would not conflict with any Bessie policy. It just states that the participating students are administered all examinations required by the pub, to pursuant to the school and district accountability system and prescribing and being prescribed a grade level. So whatever right, Bessie that's already in the bill. No, it's not. There, there is a testing mechanism in the bill for a nationally the normed test. The testing normed. mechanism in the bill talks about a test that they can pick, the school can pick not what Bessie can pick. So this says whatever Bessie selects as the national norm, these students would also take. Then B is already in a statute. And C just basically talks about giving the cohorts, once their scores come in, the same thing we do now when you go on the Department of Education website to see of how voucher students perform gives that cohort a letter grade based on their testing. Right, again, I think that, that what you're trying to do is to codify policy, and I just think that's a bad position for us to take um, as a legislature, but look, again, I appreciate your-, your we, We've um, codified policy a number of times. Right, well, not something as fluid as this, uh, but anyway, thank you. The accountability system is fluent in what test Bessie picks. It's fluent, Senator Cathy, in what test they take, what subject matters Bessie picks, What's not fluent is that every group of students, whether it be public, charter, or voucher, receive a letter grade to know how well we're performing. If it was that fluent, Bessie would never come up with a state testing norm. What's not fluent, what has never been done in this state, is that a school who receives state dollars comes up with their own test that they wanna take their own assessment. That's what's not fluent. So if you want true accountability, this is the amendment. And it will be in conformity with what Bessie should do and what they've always done with our public taxpayer dollars. So 
I see no further questions. I move favorable passage. See no questions on the amendment. Is there any objection to the adoption of the amendment? Senator Edmonds objects on your objection. I'm in complete agreement with um, Senator Andrews. We must have great accountability without any exception. That's the reason I stand to object tonight because I believe what's in the amendment tonight and I, I want to clarify what was said a few moments ago and it's not just about a test, but let me read it. A nationally normed refer reference test or assessment approved by the state board. No non-public school is gonna go pick just some random test. Let me also say to you that the testing that's being done right now by non-public schools without, without this program are the highest quality assessment test in America. We're doing that all over the state of Louisiana. It shows us exactly where our students are, and I am very grateful for Bessie and what they allow non-publish to do to report back to them so we have high level of accountability. And in this amendment that Senator Talbot uh, offered just a few moments ago that you approved, that is now the direction we will take and Bessie will make certain that our students on this level will be highly accountable. And I would ask you and I uh, plead with you to, to object to the amendment. Senator Jackson Andrews to close on your amendment. Again, members, there will be a test. I never said there wouldn't. What I said is that on page seven, lines 58 through 60, the non-public school selects which assessment they give. Never before in this state have we allowed a school to select which assessment they give and call it accountability. That's like putting lipstick on a pig and calling it a cow. That's just what it is. You cannot pick your assessment. You cannot pick your measurement of accountability. If we graded ourselves as legislators, I'd have a A on La B score. And we all know that's not true. We don't pick our own assessment. Not one school right now in this state picks their own assessment. Bessie picks the, assess the assessment. The measure by which they will be assessed. That's fact. Now, if grading your, if picking your grading scale and how you are going to be assessed is fair? You think it is? Vote the amendment down. This doesn't hinder, hinder ESAs. It just puts them in line with years of how Bessie has done their business. I've never seen in a bill. It wasn't in the voucher bill where we let each school pick their own assessment. Now, if you're talking about what we never have done, Senator Kathy, this we've never done, not even with vouchers. Not one school in this state as it stands, not one cohort, not one program that receives state's funding selects their own assessment. So I, I again, ask for favorable passage. It's, it's just reasonable. That's what it is, it's reasonable, but I know sometimes reason prevails and sometimes it doesn't. So I ask for your favorable passage. Senator Andrews has offered an amendment to House Bill 313, which Senator Edmonds has objected. When the machines are open, all those in favor of the amendment will vote yes. All those opposed to the amendment will vote no. Madam Secretary, open the machine, please. Vote your machine, members, vote your machine. Vote your machine, members, vote your machine. Madam Secretary, close the machine. 16 yeas and 23 nays, and the amendment fails to be adopted. Next amendment. Next amendment is by Senator Kathy. It is set number 3777. 
3777. Senator Kathy. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, Amendment 3777 simply says that no locally levied school district tax revenue shall be transferred to any participating school located outside of the school district where the tax is levied or any participating non-public school within the district. So it just says that your local tax dollars stay in the parish with which they're levied. Wait, hold on one second. Let's give it a second to get that amendment up real quick. Members, hit refresh. All right, so we got the amendment. All right, does anybody have any questions on the amendment? Does anybody have objection to the adoption of the amendment? Seeing no objection, amendment is adopted. Next amendment. The next amendment is by Senator Jackson. It is set number 3793, 3793. Senator Jackson. Members, I think this is gonna be an easy amendment. Since we believe, and the body has voted, that we believe that the assessment, the new assessment, the new manner of accountability that we're putting in ESAs is good, that it gives our schools some freedom, that allows students to be tested based on that curriculum. We have public schools that are magnet schools. We have public schools that are math and science schools. We have public schools that, for, that are medical magnets. I have one in my district that focus on medical magnet, CNA, and other areas. This amendment simply says, notwithstanding any other provision of law to the contrary, or any rules promulgated by the State Department of Education, the assessment standards and practices that the department adopts pursuant to this section shall become the official school and district accountability system of the state. So it basically puts everyone on the same playing field. And Senator Mizell, you talked about how some schools have different curriculums. Some public schools, by their very nature, have different curriculums. Magnet schools have different curriculums. Public schools that offer technical education have different curriculums. If we're going to give true freedom to every student and every school to become its very best, and this is the new standard, then I'm just making it a standard for every state in the school. Bessie will adopt it based on this bill, and it'll be used statewide, and we can have true measurement and true freedom. I ask for fi uh, favorable passage. I see no, <clears throat> excuse me, I see no questions on the amendment. Is there any objection to the adoption of the amendment? See no objection, amendment is adopted. Next amendment. I have no further amendment. Senator DePlessis for the floor on the bill. Sen um, Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I, I know it's late, obviously. I mean, we were hoping to have been gone much sooner, uh, but it's, it's, it's important I should share a few brief comments. I'll do my best to be brief. This is important, what I'm about to share with you all. It may change your mind, it may not, but I think you should at least be informed on what we're about to do. Uh, it's, it's often said that there's, there's nothing new under the sun and I think this will, in many ways, reaffirm that. We've been talking about ESA's education savings account. But I just learned about something else, another term. Has anyone ever heard of Louisiana Financial Assistance? Act 147 from the 1962 legislative session established the Louisiana Financial Assistance Commission. The Louisiana Financial Assistance Commission. This statute and this commission and what it was set up to do, if you read the, le if you read the language, is nearly identical to what we are doing now. 
It's important, members, for you to know that this legislation was challenged in federal court and it was deemed unconstitutional. And it was affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, 1962 was a much different time than 2024. It was different racially. It was different economically. It was different in many ways. But if you just look at the law and what was done then and what's being proposed now, it's actually kind of scary. I want to just read to you a few excerpts from the opinion. This was by Judge Wisdom, who was the lead on the opinion. It was a three-judge panel. This class action by Negro school children and their parents go against the Louisiana Financial Assistance Commission and others attacks the constitutionality of Act 147 of 1962. Just going a little further on what was said regarding this piece of legislation. Under that law, the commission administers a program of tuition grants to pupils attending private schools in Louisiana. The United States intervened as a party plaintiff. Directors of four private schools for Negro children intervened as party's defendants. The free lunches and textbooks Louisiana provides for all its school children are the fruits of racially neutral benevolence. Tuition grants are not the products of such policy. They are the fruits of the state's traditional racially biased policy of providing segregated schools for white pupils. Here that policy has pushed the state to the extreme of using public funds to aid private discrimination endangering the public school system and equal educational opportunities for Negroes in Louisiana. As certainly, as the number 12 is the next number in a series starting 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, Act 147 fitted into a long series of statutes the Louisiana legislature enacted over 100 years to maintain segregated schools for white children. After the Supreme Court's 1954 decision in the school segregation cases, the, le the legislature rapidly expanded the series as fast as the courts knocked out one school law, the legislature enacted another. Each of these laws, whether its objective was obvious or non-obvious, was designed to promote a state-supported sanctuary for white children in flight from desegregated public schools. Act 147 of 1962 is unconstitutional. The purpose and natural or reasonable effect of this law are to continue segregated education in Louisiana by providing state funds for the establishment and support of segregated, privately operated schools for white children. The United States Constitution does not permit the state to perform acts indirectly through private persons, which it is forbidden to do directly. The evidence before the court shows that the tuition grants have supplied a heavy predominance of funds needed to establish and maintain post-1954 and especially post-1962 private segregated schools. The commission's recent decision to reduce its aid to less than 50% of the funds required for operating a school fails to take the curse off the act. There is no such thing as the states legitimately being just a little bit discriminatory. Members, I'm not suggesting that anybody behind this legislation, anybody who supports this legislation, anybody who wants kids to go to private school has any racial intent. That's not what I'm speaking to. But it's important for us to know that this law, as far as I know, has not been deemed constitutional. It ha that hasn't been overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. So there are questions of constitutionality, in my opinion, and I'm not a constitutional scholar. 
But guess what? I did attend a private school. I attended public school for elementary and private school for high school. An all black Catholic boys school that, believe it or not, this all black high school was born out of segregation. Now think about that. We are talking about private schools as though they are the model for achievement. When we have private schools that exist because of the lack of fairness that exists in private institutions, which was what led to the creation of St. Augustine High School because there was nowhere else for those kids to go. And I'm fortunate that my parents was able to send me and my brothers there. Blessed, proud of my experience. But it doesn't mean that I got the best, and it doesn't mean that I couldn't have gotten better at a public school. And the state didn't pay for it. So, you know, the question becomes, what is our responsibility? If we want every kid to go to a private high school because we're saying that's the standard, well, what about what's left? What about our responsibility to the public education system in Louisiana? And I think that's what Senator Jackson has been fighting for, trying to ensure that accountability. I know that this is an important vote for a lot of people. I did a poll prior to coming into session like many of us may have done because we had the opportunity to do that. Senate District 5, the district that I represent, I asked the question, and nearly 700 people responded to that poll. 80% disapproved the use of state dollars to support private vouchers. Over 80% out of 700 people who responded in my Senate district. Your districts might be different. So regardless of where I went to school, my district, my constituents do not want to see this. They want to see us invest in the system that we have. The money that we're going to spend on this program, and we don't even know what that amount is, but the money that we're going to spend on this program, I'm willing to bet if we spent a fifth, 20% of it, on just giving teachers pay raises, that could have a better impact of fixing our school system than what we're about to do with this ESA program. I said it last week. And I know it might have offended a few people, but it's important for me to say it again because I just hold it to be true. And we just need to be honest about it. This is an abandonment of public education. It's an abandonment of public education. Thank you. I see no more. I see no one else for the floor in the bill. No more questions. Senator Edmonds to close. There he is. I know we've had enough data, but I just thought it was pretty important to note that the data in 12 other states show that students whose test scores have, all, have gone up the most are urban African Americans. And part two are the ones that the next that have gone up the most are rural. And I just thought that was pretty important. I care about kids. You care about kids. I can think of the kids that I've coached with, coached up, loved, took to church, had the best birthday party they've ever had. I love kids. I love parents. They're awesome. You love your parents, I love mine. What is this bill really about? This bill is really about giving parents another opportunity to take care of their children and to make a selection that matters as much as almost anything in life. I've said this so many times, what's one of the most important people that's ever in your child's life? It's probably your classroom teacher. So I agree, pay raises for teachers, other op opportunities to do well, this is just one thing. Is this a battle against public schools not at all this is an opportunity for us to join and i must say thank you governor for spending the afternoon with us and just like you've campaigned and many of us have campaigned we we've gone to our constituents and we've said to them with closed fist or sweat or on our brow or a snap in our step we will do something 
to change the dynamic of education in Louisiana. We will get it done. That's why you're here. I would be amiss if I didn't thank Senator Talbot for such a great work. I appreciate your help. And I thank every one of you, and I hope that right now when we, I know we've been long, but how do you close on such a hopefully historic moment that we remember tonight? We remember tonight as the next step that we have taken for the children and parents of the state of Louisiana, and you remember and think, I'm so glad that I cast my vote for the opportunity to launch ESAs in the state of Louisiana. May God bless you for your vote. Thank you. Senator Edmonds, final pastor, Senate Bill 332, machines up in favor. Yes, those opposed, no to open machines. Vote machine, members, vote machine. Vote machine, members, vote machines. Madam Secretary, closed machine, 24 yeas and 15 nays, and bill is finally passed. <laughs> Come on, folks, seriously. Senator Edmonds moves to reconsider the pass and lay the motion on the table without objection.